After a decade and a half of Liberal governments in Ontario, the 2018 election blew them not just out of power, but also reduced their seat count to below the threshold for official party status. Now they're back with a new leader, a fully costed platform released just this week, and high hopes that the tide will turn back their way. Stephen Del Duca has been at the helm for just over two years now. He was the MPP for Vaughan from 2012 to 18. In campaign 2022, he is seeking election in the riding of Vaughan Woodbridge. And Stephen Del Duca joins us now here in our makeshift studio on the fourth floor. It's good to have you back here. It's great to be here. Thanks, Steve. Pleasure. Now, I got to tell you, in my time watching Queen's Park, which only goes back about four decades, <laughs> I can't recall a new party leader who had a worse inbox, if you like, than you. <laughs> You get elected to the leadership of your party in March of 2020, days after an international pandemic is declared. We're all in lockdown. You didn't have a seat at the time. You've got to raise money. You've got to find more candidates than any predecessor of yours ever. Yeah. you got to start a policy platform process, and you've got to do it from your living room. <laughs> so my first question is, how awful have the last two years been for you? Uh, look, there's no doubt that it's been challenging to lead uh, the party during this point in time for all the reasons that you described a second ago. But, you know, people across this province have gone through so much. It's been so brutal for two years. By comparison to so many of them, uh, it hasn't been that bad. But the really exciting part for me and for Ontario Liberals is that despite how challenging it was to start from where we were, look at what we've managed to accomplish because we created a plan, we rolled up our sleeves, we worked hard, we've delivered on that plan, We've nominated a phenomenal team of candidates. We were the first party to pay off $10 million in campaign debt from 2018. And our platform development process was by far the most open and inclusive in our party's history, I think in any provincial party's history here in the province of Ontario. And that's what helped create our plan. We call it a place to grow, which is a fully costed and fair and forward-looking roadmap about how Ontario Liberals want to rebuild the province that we love. More on that in a few minutes' time. You are, I think it's fair to say, the least well-known of the three major party <laughs> leaders. How much of a handicap has that been for you as you try to connect with voters on the hustings? Well, look, it's, you know, for sure, uh, as the person who became leader just before the pandemic, uh, it's taken a little bit longer for me to be able to make sure people do know who I am. But that's kind of the beauty of election campaigns. That's what we're engaged in right now having the chance to tour around Ontario, uh, to talk about the team, to talk about the plan, uh, and I'm having a ton of fun. So as I'm out there more and more, more people say that they recognize me, that they recognize our local candidates, but more than that, more than the personalities, they know that we need responsible and competent leadership at Queen's Park to help them, not for politicians to help themselves, but to help the people of this province. So again, having a ton of fun, uh, a ton of fun and being able to introduce myself and talk directly to Ontarians, it's, it's phenomenal. Before we take a look at your platform, let's uh, spare a moment here to get some of your thoughts about the current occupant of the Premier's office sure. at Queen's Park. Your rhetoric about Doug Ford has got increasingly tough in the last few days. I saw your announcement in Scarborough this morning. Yep. You have for, for many months now actually called him unfit to govern mm -hmm. and not up to the job. And yet he's in first place in all of the polls. What do you see that apparently <clears throat> many Ontarians don't? Well, first of all, and you know this because you're a veteran of covering these things, this is why we have election campaigns. This is why each of the leaders and each of the teams that they are leading and their plans are compared and contrasted throughout an election campaign. That is the conversation and the work that we're all involved in right now. But we have seen repeatedly throughout the past four years. We've seen the cuts, we've seen the chaos, we've seen extreme examples of incompetence. And that was all before COVID struck. And then since COVID struck, we've seen the flipping and the flopping and the flailing. You know, I think about my own household, my wife and I raising two young daughters who attend publicly funded schools, parents, families, teachers, students across this province. Think about how many times in the past two years we, we had to wait till a late Friday afternoon announcement about something that might be coming, uh, keeping us all on edge, spiking our anxiety. Uh, whether we're talking about that, no plan to clear the surgical backlog, uh, the fact that he always wants to point the finger of blame at level, other levels of government, other political parties. I think that Doug Ford is demonstrating, even in the way he's handling this campaign, this it's such an important campaign. The fact that he's not talking to anyone, the fact that he doesn't have the courage of his convictions to speak to the media, the fact that you know everywhere he goes, he's reading the scripts that other people are writing for him. I mean, it seems to me, especially at this moment in time in Ontario's history, we need leaders who, who genuinely know what they want to do, 
and have that courage of their convictions. And to me, Doug Ford doesn't, and that's why I don't think he's up to the job of leading this province. Do you think, I, I've heard even his critics say, he has demonstrated a capacity to grow in the office, that he's not the same guy today that he was four years ago, as Melissa Lanceman once said, right. a bull who brings his own china shop with him wherever he goes. <laughs> Would you agree he's changed? No, I think, what we, I think what we saw was a temporary moment during the pandemic where the words on the screen in front of him changed. And so he was able to speak to those words, to read those words. Um, but I, I think about, for example, a budget that we saw just a few days ago or several days ago now. $1.3 billion cut out of publicly funded education. After what we've all gone through in this province, as an example, uh, the fact that there was no real plan to move the province forward coming from uh, Doug Ford and his team. In fact, his own finance minister refused to confirm when asked on budget day that if re-elected that they would introduce and pass that budget. I don't think, I'm guessing you've never seen that. That lack of conviction. At first, he did yeah. that at first. He well, wouldn't commit to bringing back the same budget at first. Well, could, can you think of another finance minister in your four decades of covering this stuff who on budget day itself didn't feel comfortable confirming that this was the plan that they really believed in? That's my point about the games that Doug Ford and his team play. And to me, building Ontario is not a game. It's about my parents, it's about my kids. It's about what we need to deliver for them and for everyone like them across the province of Ontario. Well, let's get into some of the details here of A Place to Grow, which sure. is the name of your plan. And uh, Sheldon, maybe we could bring this graphic up here because the Liberals do have a lot on offer. Uh, most people, I suspect, have heard about Buck a Ride <laughs> province-wide. That is the $1 transit fare for all the public transit systems in the province of Ontario. Uh, the Del Duca Liberals would also cancel Highway 413. They would end for-profit long-term care by 2028. There's a billion dollars in their plan to clear the surgical backlog caused by COVID-19. There are multi-year, multi-billion dollar investments in mental health and addictions. They are offering to bring back grade 13 as an option, hire 10,000 teachers, cap class sizes at 20, and get 1.5 million homes built over 10 years. These, of course, are just the highlights. The document <laughs> is very detailed and there's a lot more to it than that. But let me just ask you this philosophical question. It, it, if there is an overarching theme underpinning your plan, yeah. what is it? Well, the, under, the underpinning theme is if you talk to Ontarians, as, as I have now for the past couple of years and certainly in the run-up to this election campaign, you realize that despite our collective resilience and how strong we are as a people, uh, people are still hurting in this province. COVID has been really, really tough. Obviously, the tragic loss of life, uh, small business owners who were abandoned, who've lost livelihoods, uh, but students, nurses, p personal support workers, seniors, people are still going through an awful lot. And when I listen, for example, to Doug Ford and his team talk, it's like they want to pretend that the pandemic never happened. They just want to kind of skate past it. If you look at our plan, A Place to Grow, you see that it is, again, forward-looking. It is fair. I'm proud of the fact, really proud that it's fully costed. And it helps people in their day-to-day -day lives get through what they're still dealing with. Well, you say fully costed, but the NDP has done some budget crunching of their own, and I know what you're going to say. You're going to say <laughs> they announced their plan a long time ago. And 18 they, days. And they still haven't costed yeah. it, and that is true. Yeah. However, they've looked at your plan, and they say there's a $5 billion hole in there that you're relying on the federal government to fill, and you can't do that. True or false? Well, first of all, uh, it, it is untrue, uh, and I'll come back to that in a second. But again, let me just highlight, you know, uh, it's been about 18 days since the Ontario NDP released a platform. And by the way, if you take a close look at their platform, it's a platform of mostly warmed over, warmed up ideas from previous election platforms from them, uh, number one. Number two, no costing whatsoever. And it's been 18 days. Now remember, since they released their platform, Ontario budgets come out, the Auditor General's looked at the budget and talked about those numbers. The Financial Accountability Officer weeks ago uh, put out what the picture looks like in Ontario. And yet we, we don't hear anything credible from them about okay, that's them. their plans. What about you? Well, look, every single thing that's costed in our document shows that the federal government's commitments uh, to fund, for example, support for more doctors and nurses, uh, to bring up wages for personal support workers, things that we support, uh, we anticipate and believe that Ontario will get its fair share, roughly 40% of the population, uh, to help fund some of the commitments that we're making. But here's the part that I'm really proud of. Because we are a responsible and prudent um, alternative to Doug Ford's cuts and chaos, we have built in significant contingencies, three and a half billion up to four and a half billion per year to help stabilize anything that, that might present a fiscal challenge. That to me is balanced, it's responsible and it's prudent. 
and it's all there in black and white for you and the people of Ontario to see. That's, that's a plan that people can count on. You have much program spending in your plan, but I wonder whether there is adequate attention in your, pan, in your plan paid to creating the economic growth we will need to pay for all of what you are offering. So first of all, all of our revenue and economic growth projections are based on what we have seen from, for example, Ontario's independent financial accountability officer. But secondly, when I talk about publicly funded education, yes, I talk about it as a dad for sure, but I'm also talking about it from the standpoint of education being just about our very best economic policy. You know, the Conference Board of Canada once said that every dollar effectively um, invested in public education returns a dollar thirty back to the economy. You can say the same thing about early learning and childcare, which Ontario Liberals are so committed to. So I, I look at the Green Jobs Fund that we're going to create. I look at uh, how we're going to deal with uh, accelerating a series of other investments. I look at publicly funded education, lifelong skills training, uh, 1.5 million homes over a decade that we will produce in this province, about 150,000 jobs that we anticipate from that. And when Ontario Liberals do kill Highway 413, I was the transportation minister who stopped it the first time. If elected June 2nd, we're going to kill it once and for all. We're going to take those $10 billion that Doug Ford wants to waste what wants to waste, and we're going to invest that in repairing 4,500 schools across Ontario and building 200 new schools, which will put a lot of skilled tradespeople to work. There, there's an old expression in politics, and I know you know it, and that is, how can we elect you to run the province when we're not sure you can run your party? And let me set up this question by acknowledging off the top, as I did at the beginning, you had to find 117 candidates. That's correct. Which is more than any liberal leader ever. Mm. So I guess we shouldn't be too shocked that there are a few... <laughs> mm. There's a few in there that have, that have done and said some things that obviously uh, have rubbed you the wrong way and they are no longer your candidates. It's true. But it does raise the issue of whether or not you've got your act together and whether you have got a vetting process that is adequate to the task. So I guess, I guess I take a slightly different perspective on this. So number one, you are correct about the circumstances where we found ourselves two years ago. But putting that to, a, to the side for a quick second, and again, not forgetting first party to pay off the $10 million debt from the last campaign, free membership, totally open and transparent platform development process. And by the way, 100, 122 candidates running for the Ontario Liberal team who are new. I'm talking about doctors, municipal leaders, nurses, teachers, principals, small business entrepreneurs, not-for-profit advocates. It's an incredible team of talent who are ready to start the important work of rebuilding Ontario. But to me, this is, a, this is sort of the modern test of leadership. You know, I've witnessed as both Doug Ford and Andrea Horvath have been confronted with challenging information about some of their candidates or caucus members, and yet they wait, and they equivocate, and they delay. In the case of the former star candidate for Andrea Horvath and Ajax, it Steve took Parrish. Her, thank you, Steve Parrish. It took her, I want to say weeks at the very least, to finally realize that what he had done uh, while mayor and after being mayor there was unacceptable. Well, he defended the posting of a sign, I think, in the community that honored a Nazi officer that during is, the war. That is correct. And when confronted with that information, instead of saying decisively, because that's out of step with what her party and what Ontario believes in, she kind of dragged, you know, dragged it out, ragged the puck, as the saying goes. And it took weeks. Similarly, we see Doug Ford. He's got caucus members who have said things on reproductive rights for women, for example, unconscionable. And yet, they're still in his caucus. One of them the, was the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Education. That's Sam Osterhoff. It's Sam Osterhoff. He's, he's pro-life, though. That's yeah, it. He's but, just he's but, pro life. But well, yeah, but again, you know, it's my point is that that leadership today requires that you take an informed and responsible but strong stand when something is what you don't believe in. And Ontario Liberals believe in tolerance, we believe in diversity, equality, expanding opportunity for everyone in this province. And that's a standard that I'm proud for our party to live up to. Okay, in our remaining time here, uh, again, going back to the fact that people, I suspect, know you the least of all the <laughs> leaders, I'd like to just, uh, I normally don't ask personal questions, but, but you've talked about these things in the past, so sure. I think they're fair game. For sure. I, um, I've been going door-to-door -door with a lot of candidates from okay. all the different parties just to see what, you know, what's going on, what, what happens <laughs> That's out good. there. That's good. And one of your candidates the other day, and I won't reveal who the candidate is, uh -oh. <laughs> said at the door, you know, I know Stephen's not the most exciting leader out there. <laughs> But then she added, but he's smart and he's ethical, and I'm good with that. Right. I don't mean this to sound unfair or anything, <laughs> but, but 
do you have any idea why you are not quite as charismatic or as exciting <laughs> as as a lot of political leaders feel they need to be to be successful? Oh, look, I don't I don't spend a lot of time obsessing about whether or not uh, I have you know the, the the dazzling smile or the right haircut or whatever else it might be. Look, what I'm focused on is making sure we have the plan. And we do have a plan that will be good for the people we of Ontario. We do this all the time. But, you're, but you're, hang on, you're I'm pivoting away from no, my I'm, question I'm not, to talk about. So. But, but think about what we need in Ontario right now. So let's put this in a uh, sort of in a, in a first person example. If God forbid you or a loved one got sick or needed treatment from, from a doctor or, or surgery, God forbid, would you want to know as you're being wheeled into the operating room that that doctor had the world's greatest smile? Or would you want to know that she or he paid attention at medical school? Pretty sure you'd want to know that they're a good doctor. You hop on a plane. You, you want to know whether or not the pilot can deliver you know, the world's greatest and most memorable speech or that he or she knows how to take the plane off and land it safely. So what we need right now in Ontario is responsible, competent government. Leadership that shows up, that sweats the details, that looks into how we're going to create the plan that we need in this province and then has the work ethic and the dedication to actually deliver on that. And that's what I am all about. My grandparents and parents taught me and my siblings, there's no shortcut to success. It's about hard work. And frankly, Steve, I believe that's the Ontario way. And so I, we're going to keep talking, we're going to keep working hard, but I, I'm focused on people in this province and what we can deliver for them. I want to make a hard turn now and ask you about what I'm sure was the worst thing that ever happened to you in your mm -hmm. life. And I don't know how many people know this, but you and the Premier actually have something in common. We do. You yeah. have both lost a brother under incredibly <clears throat> tragic circumstances, and yeah. you talked about the death of your brother, Michael, yeah. in a video. And let's just play a snippet of that. Sheldon, if you would. My younger brother, Michael, passed away from a car accident. To this day, almost four full years later, there's this little imperceptible shock that reminds me it actually happened. It was devastating. I'd had coffee with him that morning. That was the last time I saw him alive. Ugh. Uh, I just lost a friend who I'd known for 50 years to a hit and run car accident. Yeah. So, uh, but he wasn't my brother. Yeah. But I am curious, uh, how long does it take before you get over the white hot fury of injustice at seeing a tragedy like that? Mm, I do, you know, the, because you described it as white hot, you know, I guess that, I guess that, you know, I've moved on from being white hot about it. But it, but the, the, the ache, uh, the emptiness, the, uh, the pain, uh, it doesn't go away. I mean, it doesn't. It, you don't feel it the same way. I mean, it was June 21st of 2018 when this happened to Michael. Uh, all of those memories from, from the moment learning about it to uh, talking to, you know, our family about it, sharing the news. Uh, those are those are seared into me in my memory. They will be for life. Um, but the the emptiness of knowing he's not around and I can't talk to him. I can't have a coffee with him like I did the morning that it happened. Uh, can't get a hug from the guy. Can't be told that I'm not doing my job properly because he's my younger brother. So he was always trying to hold me to account. Uh, you know, watching his his sons grow up with uh, without him around because they're still young. My nephews. Uh, all of it. All of it is just horrible. And. Uh, you know, it, it, I don't believe that goes away. People say that time heals. I don't think time heals. I think it helps, but it does not heal. And I don't expect that this wound will ever heal. 12 years difference between you two? 12 years, yeah. Michael was the baby of the family. Were you kind of like a second dad to him? <clears throat> Wouldn't say a second dad, per se, because our dad is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. um, but did have the chance when Michael was younger to coach him in hockey. Mm -hmm. uh, did have the chance to take him to a lot of hockey tournaments. Uh, and then later in life, when he became a, a real kind of fitness fiend, he helped me uh, get back into shape a couple of times. So we spent a lot of time at the gym, and it just it's every day. Miss him every single day. But we have a lot of fun as a family sharing the memories and laughing about what they were like because the times were really, really good. Hmm. Have you, uh, I, I know you and the Premier don't share a lot of political views, but I wonder <laughs> if the two of you have ever had a conversation about the thing that you have in common. No, we've never had a direct, direct conversation about it. No, and I know, I, I, I know, I, I'm, having gone through it, I'm, I'm sure it was quite, quite horrible for, for Mr. Ford and his entire family to go through losing Rob. You know, but we've never spoken about it directly. You ever spoken to him at all? Yeah, I have. I have. Uh, I mean, I'd met him a number of times before becoming leader, before he became premier, um, and since the pandemic uh, started, if I can put it that way, we, we've had the chance to speak probably about half a dozen times. Um, but, uh, and I provided advice around the vaccine certificate, around um, 
I think back to uh, a few of the other ideas that we put forward at the earliest stages. Um, and the conversations have been cordial and respectful, um, but obviously, you know, for the most part, not taking the advice that was offered. And I think that's a real shame. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left here, and let's finish up on this. Uh, we're on the fourth floor today because <laughs> our studio, where we normally do this program at the moment, has been converted uh, for a leaders' debate, which will be taking place on Monday. <laughs> yeah. Now, you did participate in the Northern Ontario leaders' it, debate, yeah. but uh, I think it's fair to say this one is going to have a larger audience than that one. That one was focused <clears throat> exclusively on Northern issues. I wonder what you see as your mission in, in as much as Mr. Ford did one last time. This will be right. the fourth time for Andrea Horvath. Right. First time for Mike Schreiner, but he's been a party leader for longer than you. Right. You're the rookie on that stage. <clears throat> More pressure? No, look, I'm so excited about having the chance to share directly, like literally directly with the people of Ontario in a very unfiltered way, why I believe I have the capacity to lead this province and why we have the plan that's fair and forward-looking and balanced and fully costed. And I think it's, it's really important for democracy and I think it's really important for Ontario families to see what I hope will be a healthy clash of ideas rather than some of the traditional mudslinging. So I, I want to keep focused on the people of Ontario and what they need and how our plan responds to them. I don't know what the other three are going to be doing, but that's my hope and that's certainly what my objective will be come Monday night. Do you have any sense, just finally here, about what you need to do to close the gap? I know mm -hmm. people are fond of saying they don't play a best of three in the Stanley Cup playoffs. They play a best of seven, so we have many games still to go. That's also true. Yeah. But, but you have a job to do that so far uh, hasn't completely paid off dividends yet. You're in second place. What do you still have to do? I, look, again, it's, that, it's that, uh, that uninterrupted, in a way, unfiltered, direct conversation with the people of Ontario. I, I think people across this province might not play, uh, pay as close attention to politics the way that you and I do and others like us do because they're busy, because they face a lot of challenges. And as I said earlier, because of this pandemic, lots of them are still hurting. But I think they're going to tune in, they're going to hear about it, they're going to talk amongst their family and friends. And what they're looking for is a leader who gives them confidence that she or he knows how to actually deliver, is competent, responsible enough, thoughtful enough, has the capacity to lead this province in the progressive way that it needs to be led. And I am excited about my chance to make that case directly to the people of Ontario. 6.30 p.m. <laughs> Monday night on TVO. Stephen Del Duca, leader of the Ontario Liberals, we're grateful you came into TVO tonight and answered our questions. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.